Chapter 17 Trieste The city and port of Trieste lies to the extreme northeast of the Adriatic coast. Historically, it was developed as a vital sea outlet for the landlocked Austro-Hungarian Empire. With the breakup of that combination, Trieste rather lost its main purpose. However, it remained an important strategic port for the Italians within the boundaries of Italy. During the Second World War the Yugoslavs had their eyes on it as a major port on their Adriatic coastline. When the Allies and the Yugoslav partisan army under Tito, defeated the Italian armies, the latter moved in and occupied Trieste for 40 days. After an initial intense confrontation with the Allied commander General Harding, the Yugoslavs were forced to withdraw from Trieste city. The Yugoslavs' brief foray to Trieste had been brutal, evident by one incident on the hills surrounding Trieste. Near the village of Pisana, was there was a foible which was a hole leading down into a huge cavern. The Yugoslavs had rounded up a large number of fascists in Trieste, taken them up to this foible, shot them, then pushed them down into the cavern below. Naturally the Italians were greatly relieved when the Yugoslavs were made to withdraw from the city. A number of British officers who had entered Trieste with the army in 1945 were still serving there seven years later, when I arrived. The odd thing was that for the army, Germany and Trieste were classed as a home posting, whilst the RAF classed it as an overseas posting. A large number of British officers had settled down very well in Trieste and many married local Italian girls. It came as a rude shock to them when in 1952 they received postings to fight in the Korean War, after all the comforts of living in Trieste. Whilst the dispute was negotiated over who should have Trieste, the Italians or the Yugoslavs, a buffer territory was established, which became known as the Free Territory of Trieste. This enclave comprised an area of coastline north and south of the city and inland up to the hills surrounding it. Two zones, Zone A and Zone B, provided a split between the Allies and the Yugoslavs. Zone A was policed by the British and American armies and Zone B, the Yugoslav army. The British general, and military governor headed a political administration pollard which controlled the Italians and Zone A the British army provided a force called the British Element Trieste Force. Betfa, and the Americans were commanded by a US Army Major General and were designated Trieste United States Troops, Trust. The joint command under the British General and Governor, were named British United States Tactical Command, Brustak. There were in 1952. Two British Army battalions with supporting elements, the Loyals and the North Staffordshire Regiment. Air support for the British, when needed, was to come from 2nd Allied Technical Air Force in Germany. To provide the necessary liaison between the British Army and the Royal Air Force a squadron leader from 2 Atif was attached to HQ Betfa. Alongside a United States Air Force major liaison with the American Air Forces. It was to this setup that I joined as the RAFLO with a signals team of three airmen, a warrant officer and two signals airmen. A communications link with two ATF was maintained for daily reports to be exchanged. My journey from Tsela to Trieste was a long and interesting one. Firstly I traveled by train to Hanover and thence by German mainline train to Frankfurt. Here I picked up the British T troop train, from the hook of Holland to Germany, Austria and Therese leaving it at Villach in southern Austria. There was a further link using Italian civilian buses to Trieste. Originally, the total link went even further, when troop ships carrying troops to and from Egypt, at the time when the British army was still in force. This last link was called Mediterranean Line of Communication, Medlock. The journey from Psela took about 36 hours although lengthy was very interesting. I had never been to South Germany, Austria or Italy so it provided an exciting new travel experience. The bus trip was carried out by a convoy of 5 or 6 buses and the journey through the Italian Alps and beyond took about 6 hours. From Villach we travelled into Italy via the Tarvisio Pass and on to Trieste. Two stops were made, en route, both of about half an hour or so. The first stop was at the mountain village of Tarvisio where we could get a drink and snack in the local cafes, and the second stop was in the city of Udine. Each section took about two hours, and the most spectacular part was through the winding alpine roads into northern Italy and then onto the plains of Lombardy. Initially, I was accommodated in the British Army headquarters officer's mess. This mess was in a villa taken over from the Italian services called Villa Modino. 
It was comfortable, the food is quite good and it had a nice swimming pool. The pool was filled from mountain stream water which was pretty cool, very welcome in the heat of the Italian midsummer. It was only a few miles journey, in the staff car, allocated to me, to the headquarters, housed in a large building on the waterfront, close to the Piazza Unita. The main square and center of the city of Trieste. I shared an office with the American Air Force Major, Tom Jones, who I immediately got on well with. He was a former fighter pilot who had also, like myself, been stationed in Germany. Tom was a bachelor and quite a character, enjoying a very wide circle of girlfriends, all recorded in a notebook along with their addresses. I think it would have been worth a fortune if auctioned. I often covered up for him between one girlfriend and another. Trieste is a beautiful city lying in a semicircular bay, surrounded by hills to the north and west, about 1000 feet high. The rise from the city to the hills is rapid and, from the city to the outskirts of the hilly part of the city was only about 5 miles in distance. The view of the Adriatic and the city and port from the hills was quite spectacular and beautiful. The governor, in my time, Major General Sir John Winterton, had a residence at Duino Castle. This historic castle was situated along the coast to the north some 10 miles out of the city, famed as the site where Dante wrote his renowned inferno. The American general and his headquarters were housed in Mirama Castle, more modern and close to the city, but in beautiful grounds. One British battalion was in the city and one at Lazaretto to the extreme southern tip of Zone A, alongside the Yugoslav Zone B, on the rocky Dalmatian coastline, about 15 miles south of Trieste. After settling in I was taken around to meet the COS of all the various British army units. I was also introduced to the American commander and his staff. My warrant officer, Jim Lake was a first class man and we struck up a very good relationship. The two airmen on my staff were both on national service and turned out to be a very good value. The first two weeks in Trieste went very quickly, but I was on my way back to Tsela to collect Gladys and Valerie. It was sad to leave Tsela and all the friends we had made. Fortunately, our friends the Bevans needed a new maid and they took Renata over, so we were very pleased to see her settled with a really good family. For the third time in a month, I set off on the long journey between Tsela and Trieste, this time in our Ford Anglia. It was to be the first time I did such a long continental car journey. Of course the German part of the trip was down the wonderful autobahn road system, as we took the ring road which took us past the Ruhr and on down to South Germany via Frankfurt and Munich. We stopped one night at a village hotel in South Germany near Frankfurt, then driving on through Bavaria, calling in at Birchtergarten, Hitler's former country home where he lived in the famous Eagle's Nest. From there we traveled into Austria through the Bavarian mountains and on to Innsbruck where we stopped the night. The city lived up to its reputation for it is quite beautiful and lies in such wonderful alpine scenery. One could feel the tremendous history of the place. It was certainly an area we planned to return to. The journey through the rest of Austria went without incident and with great enjoyment, as we passed from Austria to Italy through the Brenner Pass. The remainder of the journey was through the Italian Alps, Lake Guadir and through Bolzano and the alpine ski resort of Cortina di Ampezzo. The final run into Trieste took us through Udine and into Trieste. It had been a great experience to travel, over three days, some 900 miles, passing through Germany, Austria and Italy. Our initial accommodation was in the Hotel Excelsior on the waterfront by the main square in Trieste. This hotel had been requisitioned by the British to house families, but half of it had been derequisitioned and had become a civilian hotel again. The army side of the hotel was a bit grim and overcrowded with families and the food rather indifferent. The Italian waiters found it hard to say squadron leader. One, Antonio, came to me one day and asked, squadron leader is same as major, maybe we call you major, okay from then on I was known as Majori Aviazioni Inglese but, Majori for short. At a price we could eat a grave la carte from the civilian side of the hotel, which we did quite often. There was also a first class nightclub in the hotel called the Rouge et Noir, which was decorated in those colors. We went there quite often and danced to top Italian bands. Living in the city was also handy to all the lovely shops and amenities. We also had excellent service facilities, clubs, cinemas etc both British and American, which we could use. 
It was in fact a great family posting and we soon got to thoroughly enjoy it all. The British Officers Club had a fine swimming pool and we spent a lot of time there, where later on I nearly met a nasty end. A new 10 meter diving board had been erected and I was asked to test it. I dived down into the water and seemed to go down for a long time. When I returned to the surface, the officer in charge of the pool said he was glad I came up okay, as they had hoped it was deep enough. As I was the bird man they thought I was the best one to it try out. God knows what would have happened if it had not been deep enough. Meals were cheap and of good quality, encouraging us to eat out a lot in the many fine Italian restaurants. We also took frequent trips around Trieste, into the hills and out of the free territories to visit Italian cities. The most popular was Venus which was only 3 hours drive away, but when we went there we would spend a night or two and see the famous sights. On one special occasion we were able to go to hear the famous La Scala Milan Opera Company perform when it was in Trieste. On a special permit we could travel into the Yugoslav Zone B down to the seaside resort at Portarosa. We only went there twice as it had all the low standards of any eastern communist state, a rather depressing area to visit but, an education to see it. Viewing the effects of an oppressive communist dictatorship we wondered what it must be like to live permanently under such awful and restrictive conditions. Initially, I found it difficult to get the army very interested in having any air support written into their exercises, whether in the field or, in what were called paper exercises. These were mainly staff and communications exercises and were called TEWTS, training exercises without troops. I also found it hard to make visits to the various army units, but, in a surprising way I achieved success. I entered into army sport whenever I could and played for the headquarters soccer and cricket teams. My knowledge and experience in soccer became noticed and I was asked to become secretary of command football. I was also appointed captain of the HQ side. These activities meant that I could go to any army unit on football business. Gradually I found COS asking me to attend training exercises and provide air support input. As a family we joined in all the social activities, played tennis and generally mixed and with our army colleagues. I became an accepted and respected member of the Royal Air Force, and as the only one in blue, we got invited to many of the various social events. We also had frequent RAF visitors from Germany and from the various air attaches based in communist countries. They enjoyed their visits to Trieste with its freedom and high social activities. It was a huge difference to their lives under communist regimes, where they were followed everywhere, also knowing that their offices and homes were bugged. For my part their visits were also extremely valuable for the intelligence information it provided. One RAF visitor, Group Captain Gordon Finlayson, bought me shock news of the tragic death of Group Captain Roger Porteous in an aircraft crash. Roger and his wife were going to her HQ summer ball and he had been flying a vampire to meet up with his wife Margaret, who had been traveling by car. His aircraft went off the runway and burst into flames and he was burned to death. Margaret Porteous had arrived at her destination later only to be told of Roger's tragic death. I was shattered to learn of his death, and felt quite sick to hear of such a fine officer and friend to be lost this way. During my tour I was invited to visit the RAF Air Attaché in Rome, where I was made most welcome and shown all around Rome by his assistant. It was my first visit to this beautiful city and I loved it. The Air Attaché asked me to make visits to Italian Air Force bases at Treviso, near Venus and Udine on his behalf. Subsequently, I paid visits to these two bases, and found Treviso most interesting. The Italian Air Force had a wing of P-47 American Thunderbolt fighters there at the time, but, they were just receiving their first jet F-80 American fighters. The USAF liaison officer told me that the serviceability of the P-40s was amazing and a tribute to the Italian's natural flair as engineers. The Italian colonel had served with the RAF at the latter part of the war, when many Italians switched away from the Germans to the Allies. He had flown Spitfires and was very pro-RAF consequently, he made me very welcome and invited me to visit whenever I wished. His offices were equally hospitable and I really enjoyed my future visits, especially their offices mess which was excellent and with superb food. Eventually, 
Two RAF squadrons of Meat It Was and Vampires came down to traverse for an exercise over Trieste in cooperation with the British and American Army units. Life in Trieste was seldom dull and I had some very good detachments away from there. One such detachment was for a NATO exercise in Germany as an umpire. Firstly, I was required to spend three days at NATO HQ at Fontainebleau just outside Paris, the former home of the French kings. This was my first visit to the magic city and I loved it. And to be one of many such visits over the years, for I have never lost my fondest of this exciting capital. Following the three days briefing I went to an American Air Force base at Landstall in South Germany. Due to my Italian posting I was teamed up with an Italian Air Force officer, one Colonel Giacomelli. Who had been a pre-war officer and had a most interesting story to tell of his time serving alongside the Luftwaffe and later with the RAF the Germans had imprisoned him for a time to stop him. Switching sides, when I asked him about the Luftwaffe pilots, his answer was interesting. He said that all Air Force pilots, whether they be Italian, German or English or as he described, all pilots are similar, the exercise at Landstall was a hoot, due to Giacomelli's limited English, but, with my smattering of Italian we managed quite well. However, he could not understand the fast speaking Americans so he said, Bates, you listen to Americanos and you speak with me later, this worked better, but we did have one hilarious incident. I had a poisoned wrist from a mosquito bite I picked up in Paris. Nobody believes this when I tell them. But, it is true. The wrist got very bad and I went to the American base hospital. Before I left Giacomelli, I told him I would not be away too long. The American medical officer deemed otherwise and said he would have to anesthetize the wrist and lance it. This was going to take some little time, so I thought I had better phone Giacomelli. The conversation went like this. Colonel, this is Bates, Giacomelli Bates, he not here, he gone hospital, me. No colonel, this is Bates here, repeated several times I realized we were getting nowhere. So I arranged with the American MO to go and see Colonel Giacomelli first to explain and then return for the operation. When I met Giacomelli he said Bates, I glad you comed, someone has phoned for you. He kept saying Bates so I say you comed back later, gone hospital, NATO could be interesting in language problems at times. The exercise processed along this somewhat unusual background with limited success. Nevertheless, I had liked the colonel and we had really got on very well together, despite the language difficulties. A further very interesting detachment was when I got the chance to be invited to RAF Schwechert, the airfield which is now Vienna International Airport. The RAF had a communication squadron there and they had Anson aircraft. I was offered the chance to do a 10 day visit to renew my instrument rating and do as much flying as possible. I traveled on the Medlock bus to Village and then caught an overnight train to Vienna. This meant crossing into the Russian zone of Austria to Vienna and then to Schwechert which lay a few miles out of Vienna and in their zone. One had to have a special pass to travel into their zone and to be wearing a uniform. I found it a bit uneasy to be questioned in the early hours of the morning by a grim faced Russian army officer, accompanied by a soldier with a machine gun. Fortunately, all went well and I went on to Vienna, where I was met by an RAF officer from Schwechert. It was a very worthwhile visit because I got plenty of flying and renewed my instrument rating. We also did a trip to Graz airport, carrying Major General Urquhart who achieved such fame as the officer commanding British 1st Airborne Division at the ill-fated Unheim invasion. He was a fine looking man and it was an honor to fly him. To fly out of Schwechert from the Russian zone into the British zone of Austria we flew down a special air corridor, along which was the Russian Air Force MiG base at Wiener Neustadt. It was, unusually, a grass field without sealed runways, but the MiG-15 fighters operated quite satisfactorily from there. The Russians would often come over to Schwechert and beat it up in their MiGs. They used to fly for a short intensive period of about a week each month and then hardly fly again. It appeared that they had a special quota of flying for each month and they flew it all off in one rush. My visit to Vienna also gave me a chance to see this romantic city and I was not disappointed. Apart from seeing all the lovely buildings also the famous Schönbrunn Palace, home of the Austrian emperors and empresses with all its priceless treasures. 
one only saw Russian officers walking around the city off duty, for their other ranks were only allowed into the city when on duty. Whilst there I went three times to see opera at the superb folks opera house with one memorable night when I went to see Deros and Cavalier. One Sunday when I was in Vienna I had a wonderful day out with another RAF officer from Schwechert, roaming around the glorious Vienna woods. We visited beer gardens and restaurants and walked amongst the beautiful trees. I returned to Trieste very satisfied with this trip. In Trieste, we were very lucky to be so close to Austria which was only 3 hours or so drive away. There was a services leave center at the Village Golf Club, where in winter we could ski and in summer, play golf and enjoy water sports on the Worth Sea. This is a huge scenic lake surrounded by the mountains and hills. We also visited the city of Klagenfurt a few miles away. On one occasion I took a Trieste Army soccer team to Klagenfurt to play the British Army team in Austria. Whilst I was there a Yugoslav civilian light aircraft crashed at Graz, which I went to view with an RAF accident investigator. I did not expect the gruesome sight I was to be exposed to. The bodies of the two people killed in the crash had been removed. Whilst looking over the debris, I kicked aside a load of papers and under them was a human ear, torn from the head of one of the victims. It gave me quite a shock and I can still vividly see it at times. Not a pleasant memory, we continued our life in Trieste amidst all these very enjoyable trips. Winter in Trieste was not too bad weather wise, being wet rather than cold, although we did have some cold spells with winds off the Austrian and Italian Alps. By now we had been allocated a nice apartment in an area called Villa Giulia, situated on the second floor of a three-story block, sited several hundred feet above Trieste city center. From here we had a superb view of the port, the city, and out into the Adriatic. At night we sat and looked out from our balcony at all the lights, a really superb view. Each night a fleet of fishing vessels could be seen going out with all their twinkling lights. Frequently, the Lloyd Trestino shipping line cruise ships came into the port and stayed a day or so, a grand sight, all lit up and looking very exciting. After a year or so the political scene began to get tense. The Italian government were pressing for the return of Trieste and the Yugoslavs also demanding to take it over. We were the meat in the sandwich. With the large Italian population in the city of Trieste, the Italian government were easily able to foster public demonstrations. Towards the end of 1952 things started to heat up and demonstrations began to get more violent. The Venezia Giulia police force, the civilian police force in Trieste, which were commanded by British police officers, began to have difficulty in controlling the demonstrations. The British and American armies were put on alert to back up the civilian police if necessary. It was a new experience for us to be in this situation and Gladys found it rather scary. Valerie was still only 9 years of age and didn't really understand it all. We had an Italian maid who spoke very little English so she couldn't tell Valerie much. We were now getting towards the end of our tour of Germany and Italy and our thoughts were returning towards our return to UK whilst we had really enjoyed our stay in Trieste. With things looking rather difficult we were not sorry to be leaving. It was decided to evacuate the British families and Gladys and Valerie went home. How long I would have to stay was not yet determined, and after they left I moved back into the officers mess at the Villa Modiano. The demonstrations turned ugly and we had bad riots accumulating on the 5th of November, 1952. A huge crowd of demonstrators massed in Plaza Unita and the police had to call on support from the British army who opened fire, killing one of the leading demonstrators and injuring many others. I was in the HQ operations center at the time and found myself horrified to be involved in my first experience of civil riots. I was advised to drive back to the mess keeping away from the main streets and square, so I drove rapidly and was glad to get to the mess which was now under heavy guard. One group of rioters broke into one hotel housing British officers and were driven out by the officers using any weapon that came to hand. Even billiard balls, a golf club and a water jug were used to profound effect and the rioters left, bloodied and beaten. After a tense day or so things settled down, but, they were never quite the same again. My end of tour now approached, but, I was advised that I would have to stay on a while to see how events unfolded. This meant that I would have to spend Christmas in Trieste, away from my family, now in Carnarvon. 
the British and American governments stood firm, but, as further tensions rose the Yugoslavs and Italians moved troops up to the frontier. For a time it looked as if we and Trieste might be caught up in a bloody war, and that Italy might move their army into Trieste, but, fortunately, both armies took up only defensive positions and a stalemate existed. Finally, the British and American governments, through diplomacy, arranged a settlement. The Italians would take over the city of Trieste and part of the surrounding area and the Yugoslavs would take over Zone B and a part of territory and Zone A surrounding Trieste. As the political settlement was not to be affected for six months the RAF decided to let me be relieved after Christmas. My successor was a squadron leader John Bazaget, one of two quite well known RAF brothers. I spent a happy Christmas knowing that I would be going home in January. The festive season was quiet in Trieste, but, we were able to have a real party time with an abundance of food and drink but, regrettably no families. Just before our left I took a last weekend trip up to Villach which was very welcome. A number of the army wives had moved up into Austria to wait whilst the troubles were on, so, I was able to take letters, presents and messages from the husbands to cheer them up. When my time came to leave I was wined and dined by a number of army units. It was nice to feel that I had put the RAF in good light amongst the army. Colonel David Meenal, the chief of staff, a thorough gentleman and fine staff officer, was very complimentary to me at my final interview with him. The RAF do not show officers their confidential reports, unless they are adverse. It is, therefore, possible to be damned by faint praise. The army are different and David Meenal showed me mine, the only time I ever saw one. It was very nicely praising but not over flattering. He also got General Winterton to write a few kind words, who commented on my good work, good mixing and popularity with my army colleagues. I felt really pleased at his outcome. When I reported to HQ 2nd ATAF the personnel staff commented that I was one of the few RAF officers to get such a good report from the army. Later, I was interviewed by the Commander-in-Chief, Air Marshal Sir Harry Broadhurst who had been SASO when I was at the HQ at the start of my tour in Germany. He notified me that I was to be posted to HQ Bomber Command to BOC the communications flight and personal pilot to the Commander-in-Chief Bomber Command. I was on Cloud 9, my journey from Trieste to Germany in my own car had been a three-day trip which I had now done three times. My companion in the left hand seat was my daughter's huge blue toy bear we called Harvey, which we had won at the famous Oktoberfest in Cellar. I had used Harvey quite often as a companion when I drove to and from Trieste, Italy and Austria. It seemed to divert customs officers from asking too many awkward questions, as they called their comrades to come and see Harvey. I traveled in uniform which also helped. I had a few days at HQ 2A TAF being debriefed before setting off across Germany, Holland and Belgium to catch the cross-channel ferry from Austin to Dover. It was winter and pretty snowy and cold over the whole of my trip from Trieste to Germany through the Low Countries to Austin. At least this time my car was fairly new and had a heater, unlike my journey a few years earlier to Kinloss. Looking over my two and a half years tour of Germany and Italy I could be well pleased. Gladys. Valerie and I had been able to see a great deal of Western Europe. In addition, I had received promotion to squadron leader and I had been given good reports from both the RAF at Tseller and the army in Trieste. My time with the army did me a great deal of good on my way to being a better officer. They have fine traditions and standards and a lot of these good points rubbed off. I had also to look forward to going back to a very interesting flying job in command of a squadron. My flying in Germany and Italy had been pretty limited, being confined to some jet time in cellar, some flying in American Army communications aircraft in Trieste and a short spell in Austria. It had been my first spell on ground duties and I was keen to get back to full-time flying. I arrived at Dover and enjoyed a pleasant drive to London, in bright sunny weather, where Gladys met me. We had been separated for six months and I had missed her and Valerie tremendously. We stayed a night at a hotel in London and then drove on to HQ Bomber Command. I was interviewed by Air Vice Marshal McKee, a New Zealander who had a distinguished career as a bomber pilot. He was SASO at HQBC and after he spoke to Air Marshal Sir George Mills the Commander-in-Chief, 
They confirmed my posting and I went off on leave happily settled about the future. We drove from HQBC at High Wycombe up to Carnarvon where I was reunited with little Valerie and Gladys's family. With all these satisfactory events behind me I could enjoy my leave and prepare to take up my new appointment.